Welcome everyone uh, uh, for another webcast of the International Commission of Jurists. My name is Massimo Frigo and I'm a senior legal advisor with the International Commission of Jurists. And if you're following us, you know that today we are going to discuss about uh, a landmark judgment issued yesterday by the European Court of Human Rights in its grand chamber format uh, on the case of Selahattin Demirtas versus Turkey. This was a judgment that was uh, waited for some time uh, that uh, will have profound implications both for Turkey and for the rest of the Council of Europe. And today I'm extremely happy and glad, uh, just not to say honored, uh, uh, to have with us uh, uh, some of the legal minds uh, that worked um, on the case of Selahattin Demirtas, and I'm so very glad to have here Professor Basha Kali, uh, who is Professor of International Law at the Ertia School and co-director of the School Center for Fundamental Rights, and Karen Maltiparmak, uh, who is a renowned uh, Professor of uh, Human Rights Law and uh, currently also uh, ICJ Legal Advisor and Consultant for the International Commission of Jurists. Uh, I'm very, very happy to have you both here. Uh, I'm going to change a bit the configuration so that we are all actually now uh, in the same room. Again, this is an informal chat. Uh, we are going to, I'm going to try to lead uh, probably very incompetently uh, because I'm not probably the best. Uh, so I'm going to more listen to you to explain uh, things on this judgment. But first of all, I wanted to tell to all the people following is that we're going to try to make this as interactive as possible in the next hour. Uh, so please, uh, if you're on Facebook, uh, if you're on Twitter, if you are on YouTube, Feel free to leave a comment. Uh, we're going to see it and we're going to try to address them uh, if it's a relevant comment. If not, we are not going to try to address it at all. Uh, that said, uh, I'm very happy again to have you here. Uh, and uh, my first question, and uh, I don't know, I will, I, will, I will actually ask to decide yourself who wants to start. Um, it's a bit to understand also for those who do not know uh, outside of court, of Turkey, who is Selhat in Demirtas, and uh, why are we discussing about a case uh, about Selhat in Demirtas? So, what's this case about in terms of facts? Uh, who are we talking about, and why it is important? I don't know, Bashak, Karim, who of you would like to start? I mean, we haven't decided, Bashak. No, we haven't. Do you want to start, or shall I? Okay. Uh, I, I can start a, a little bit. Uh, maybe very briefly and then leave um, to, to Karen. Um, so uh, Selatin Demirtas is, um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a Turkish uh, Kurdish um, politician. Um, he's uh, born in um, 1973. So he's a very young politician. He's just about our age. I don't know about your age, Massimo, but he's a, a, in the Turkish- He's younger than us. <laughs> Okay, so in the, in the Turkish political scene, uh, this is very young uh, to be at this age and to be a politician. Uh, he is a lawyer, he's a graduate of Ankara University Law School. And uh, in the earlier part of his uh, career, he worked as a lawyer and he has uh, worked on human rights cases as well as a lawyer. So, um, but what how we know uh, Demirtas uh, more popularly in Turkey is, of course, through his political work. Uh, he uh, became a member of parliament in 2007, and he was continuously a member of parliament until um, 2018. Um, and uh, maybe I'll leave to Karam to talk about uh, you know, what else, what other than being a member of parliament uh, he was for, for the audience who may not uh, know the invitation. I think his, his success in politics is quite important to understand why this case is also very important for the uh, Turkish politics as well as uh, the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights because before he became a uh, candidate for presidency in 2014, pro-Kurdish parties were getting around 
five six percent of votes uh, in Turkey, but he became candidate in the presidential election in 2014, and he got a, around nine percent of votes. And for the first time, a pro Kurdish socialist party passed the very high Turkish threshold, ten percent in 2015 election. Uh, so since uh, 2002, for the first time, uh, the AKP lost its majority in the parliament in that election. Uh, and uh, he famously uh, made a speech at the parliament stating that, uh, targeting Erdogan, we will not we will not make you president, we will not make you president, we will not make you president. And everything started uh, after that speech, uh, we believe. Uh, after June elections in, held in 2015, uh, the uh, AKP couldn't um, have a coalition with any other party in the parliament and uh, elections was renewed in November uh, 2015, uh, HTP. Uh, once again passed uh, the threshold, but this time uh, it, it got about 10.50% of the votes. Uh, and after then, the whole policy of the government changed against Demirtas and the party and to the Kurdish problem. Uh, the solution process, uh, as it is uh, described by the government, ended in 2015, and President Erdogan openly invited prosecutors to initiate investigations against Kurdish politicians. And he also invited parliaments to uh, lift the immunity of uh, MPs. And uh, Demirtas, as the leader of the party, uh, stood firm against these uh, policies. Uh, and I think then, then uh, all uh, legal cases uh, brought against him uh, followed uh, this background. So we are in a situation in which uh, uh, one of the leaders of an opposition party found himself uh, under arrest and uh, his current is still uh, detained uh, and he's been subject to, um, to prosecutions uh, uh, in, in Turkey. So it's a highly level political case we are talking about here and to make understand also to the people who are following us the, the high level political case we are talking about uh, uh, let me just refer to something that uh, happened just this morning this morning the website of the european court of human rights has been subject to a cyber attack we have uh, uh, also a press release of the european court accidentally uh, exactly what after the release of uh, the judgment of Anselat in the Mirtash case. And I can also witness that because this morning I was looking for the judgment and that was the only judgment that disappeared from UDOC uh, temporarily. Uh, so um, this is really what we call a hot topic case. So uh, first of all, let me uh, extend the congratulations to both of you and for uh, the result of this judgment for human rights lawyers who work in this field. We know how much work it goes into uh, legal work. It goes really into elaborating this. This is not really just going to a hearing or representing something. This is years and years of uh, studying and, uh, and drafting and discussions and everything. It's really uh, a long work. Uh, and with that, I wanted a bit to uh, to ask you about yesterday's judgment, in the sense, uh, if you were to cite uh, Denzel Washington a bit in Philadelphia, if you were to explain to a six years old um, a bit, uh, uh, what has the court ruled yesterday? What has they, have they ruled in the case of Selahati in the Mirtash? Uh, what violation have they found and why? I don't know, Bashak, maybe? <laughs> we take the turns, uh, we go around yeah. the floor. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I think we, we can explain uh, the judgment in very simple terms, but perhaps just before that, um, so this is um, a grand chamber judgment, which means that there was a chamber judgment prior to, to this case, 
Uh, and if we just uh, remind the, the listeners chronologically, uh, Demirtas was arrested and detained on the 4th of November 2016. And when he was arrested and detained, he was a member of parliament. Uh, so his court cases then uh, started, uh, and he has a very uh, important and large team of legal uh, representatives and lawyers who started to pursue to challenge these det detention orders in domestic courts and uh, first instance courts and <laughs> in all the procedures that exist in the Turkish legal system and all the way to the Turkish constitutional court and uh, they were not successful. So then the case came to the chamber of the European Court of Human Rights in, um, uh, in uh, 2017 and the chamber decided in um, the 20th of November, uh, 2018. So I was involved uh, in this case after the chamber judgment uh, in relation to the discussions um, that started about whether uh, Demirtas wanted to take his case to the grand chamber, which needs to follow what is called a referral uh, procedure. And um, uh, the grand chamber is not an appeals court, uh, so no one can take it uh, uh, to the grand chamber, um, you know, when you don't like the judgment. Uh, but you have to raise uh, the issue that the chamber judgment raises some serious interpretive issues with, with regard to the convention. So this is how this case has traveled all the way <clears throat> to the grand chamber. And um, I was... Uh, assisting the legal team uh, uh, together with uh, Dr. Art Alteparmak to work on the Grand Chamber defense. So, uh, so we, this, is the, this is the section that we, we are able to talk about. So my first uh, sort of a short summary of what did the Grand Chamber um, say uh, is, is, is a question that was put to the Grand Chamber and uh, uh, we uh, in the Grand Chamber hearing uh, that took place in September 2019, so a very long time ago, uh, we asked the European Court of Human Rights uh, to find that uh, the initial detention of Demirtas and his continuing detention uh, every single day after his initial detention uh, was a violation of the European Court of Human Rights. And it wasn't just a violation of the right to arbitrary deprivation of liberty, but that it was also a violation of his um, political expression as a member of parliament and as an opposition leader. So the Grand Chamber did decide that the initial detention and the ongoing detention of Demirtas until today is unlawful under the convention and that his detention carried out the purpose of silencing uh, the political speech of Mr. Demirtas. So that will be my very short summary. Thank you, Karim. Would you add something? Um, there are too many new things uh, in this judgment, so I don't know which ones should be prioritized. Uh, first of all, uh, I think this is one of the greatest success of the case. Uh, the court decided uh, about the uh, immunity lifting process uh, of the Turkish parliament, because uh, as some of our uh, audience might know, uh, Turkish parliament amended the constitution to lift the immunity of MPs in 2016. And yes, this was not uh, ordering uh, arrest and detention of uh, politicians, but that was the legal basis that paved the way for uh, arrest and detention. That's why we argued before the court that not only the legal basis that enabled courts to uh, arrest and detain uh, uh, Demirtas, but also this Immunity lifting process should also meet legality uh, standards of the European Convention on Human Rights. And uh, although I, I and I think Bashak uh, believed a lot on this, we were surprised that we, we could uh, also convince the courts to that. And 
this 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 is a really big 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 step because uh, you know uh, uh, we know from uh, Kabbalah case that Turkish authorities uh, release uh, victims from one case and arrests in the second one. So this is unending process. Uh, and the government claims that the application is about the first detention. So if a person is detained in, in another investigation, then um, the, the European court judgment becomes uh, inapplicable. However, uh, in Demirtas uh, case, by finding that uh, uh, immunity lifting process does not meet quality of the law requirements uh, of uh, Article 5, uh, the court also meant that any criminal investigation uh, initiated against Demirtas and also for other politicians uh, will also be legally uh, against the convention because all those criminal investigations have been started after his immunity was lifted. And now the court says that uh, this process uh, does not meet convention stand standards. And why does the court say this? First of all, the court very strongly refers to the report of Venice Commission. The Venice Commission stated that this was an ad hominem legislation targeting 154 MPs in the parliament. So although it was worded in a general way, uh, it targeted um, individuals. Uh, that's why uh, this cannot be uh, called uh, a law according to the convention. Secondly, the European court, uh, accepting our argument, uh, stated that that uh, constitutional amendment was not foreseeable for the applicant and other MPs. That meant that when he made a speech in 2012, while he was an MP, he, could, he couldn't foresee that in future sometime, his immunity will be lifted by, uh, by the parliament. Uh, and because there's a normal procedure where uh, under which uh, an MP's uh, immunity can be lifted at the parliament, but this includes a process where uh, individual MP can defend his rights before the parliament and later before the constitutional court. But with this amendment, uh, without requiring any procedure to defend uh, their rights, um, immunity of 154 MPs uh, were lifted. So I think this, this part of the uh, judgment is quite important, but I think this, is, this might be again, for the first time in the history of the court's jurisprudence, uh, the court found another legality problem on the same article. Uh, it also stated that article 314 of the Turkish criminal court, which uh, enables courts to punish individuals for membership to terrorist organization is not foreseeable because the criteria developed by the court of cassation uh, have been uh, arbitrarily implemented in different cases, including Demirtas. So um, very weak evidence became uh, sufficient to convict individuals under this provision, uh, including uh, Mr. Demirtas. So uh, rather than going into a discussion about necessity in a dem democratic society, the court found that there was no legal basis to restrict the freedom of expression of uh, Mr. Demirtas because his immunity was lifted um, in, in an unforeseeable way and uh, his criminal case was uh, interpreted by the uh, Turkish judicial authorities again in a very uh, unforeseeable uh, way. I think this this part departs from the chamber judgment and might be the most uh, crucial part of the decision. Thank you, Karim. Uh, so we we've heard that yeah, it's the crucial part. Uh, 
is uh, about the question of immunity and the principle of legality. Uh, I, I must admit, I, I'm always fascinated uh, when uh, I, I see the Article 18, it's just because uh, uh, it's so rare to have judgments on Article 18. Uh, for the listeners, since Article 18 of the European Convention on Human Rights is uh, the article that speaks about what we call the abuse of restrictions. Human rights can be, some human rights, most of them, can be restricted in certain circumstances to protect, uh, for example, public order, public order or national security. In certain circumstances, we talk about freedom of assembly, for example, freedom of expression. However, Article 18 says that the restrictions permitted under the Convention to these rights and freedoms shall not be applied for any purpose other than those for which they have been prescribed. And the courts, uh, uh, exactly in the line of reasoning that he, uh, Karim, you were stressing, uh, they actually, I think, issued a very strong uh, ruling on, uh, on Article 18 in this case uh, about what we call the ulterior motive for which these things were done. I don't know, Bashak, if you, if you have any comments about uh, uh, what the court has found on Article 18 and, uh, and what bearing this will have, uh, uh, you think, for, for Serhati Demirtas and also for rule of law in Turkey in general. Um, thank you, Massimo. I think um, for, for those who are um, looking to read the judgment or who haven't yet read the judgment, uh, I would also um, encourage uh, to kind of see the, the way in which Article 18 was discussed in a more holistic way, because the, I think the key point in this judgment is not only what the court said in Article 18, but what the court said also under Article 10 and our, under Article 5. So in this case, the finding of an Article 18 violation was found in conjunction with Article 5. So that's arbitrary uh, deprivation of uh, liberty article, so that it said the detention was not only arbitrary, but it also pursued an ulter ulterior political purpose that will be the silencing of the applicant. But the silencing of the applicant is closely connected to the fact that his, his, uh, his speech was restricted through criminal prosecutions uh, in the follow-up of the lifting of the immunity of Demirtas as a member of parliament. So what I'm trying to say is that the findings of Article 18 is really closely connected to findings that Karam just discussed um, under Article 10. So th this, is a, this is a judgment, what you may call a very integrated judgment. So if you only read the Article 18 section, uh, to, to do the analysis, I think it will be slightly missing because you have to pretty much read the, the, the whole section. But coming back uh, to your question on Article 18, you're absolutely right. Uh, the court has found um, only, I think, 18 violations of Article 18, uh, if, if we exclude the chamber finding uh, in Demirtas. So this is sort of the 19th authoritative finding of an Article 18 case. This is a very small case law. It's a fastly emerging case law, and, um, and it's still a case law that is not very well um, settled. So in this case, the court really relies on its previous grand chamber judgment. Uh, there has been only one grand chamber judgment, uh, well, not one, but one authoritative judgment in the case of Meravashvili versus Georgia. Uh, and in that case, uh, a very important case on Article 18, the court had to discuss questions about standards of proof. So how does a judicial organ, such as the European Court of Human Rights, establish the existence of uh, ulterior purposes when state authorities um, restrict rights? And this is a very serious, a very important question. And uh, in Emerbeishvili, the court relaxed its evidentiary uh, requirements, and it has held uh, that uh, sort of a, a you know a, a standard uh, proof, uh, the the standard of proof expected for all other violations must also apply to Article 18, uh, which means that uh, the court said, well, I have to see, uh, you know, the chronology of events. 
sequencing of events, temporal relationships uh, between the events, um, whether there are any manifest irregularities in the functioning of uh, the, the judiciary, and whether, whether uh, there are uh, unexplainable uh, sort of ranges of uh, events that have sort of followed on onto one another. And in this case, I think the, the very important emphasis about uh, Article 18 is the temporal inference uh, that the court has established between a sequence of events that um, has taken place in, in recent Turkish political and judicial history. And uh, the court uh, paid a very significant attention uh, to the fact that uh, exactly how Kerem started his talk, that uh, this one political party, an opposition political party, and its democratically elected members of parliament were subject to a very heavy uh, targeting uh, by, the, by the government, uh, starting from uh, uh, 2015, and in particular, after the collapse of the peace talks between the government uh, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the terrorist organization, armed group, uh, in July 2015. So for the court, that deterioration of, uh, of political events, the change of course of Turkish politics in 2015, uh, became a very important sort of a temporal starting point to understand this uh, inferences between uh, how uh, a, a democratically elected member of parliament was first politically framed as a terrorist and then was subject to a very serious amount of prosecutions and detention uh, in, the, in the light of this. So this temporal inference discussion uh, is, I think, very significant for Article 18. But it also ties into the question of the lifting of immunities of, of members of parliament uh, as well, uh, because the court under Article 10 says that it completely agrees with the Venice Commission's report that the process of the lifting of immunities uh, by parliament was an abuse of a constitutional process. So that part of the discussion is not under Article 18, but it is a discussion that the court holds under Article 10 of the, of the judgment. So, and obviously that part also coheres with its discussions um, under Article 18. But uh, the court uses temporal inferences um, and, uh, you know, and the temporal inferences between uh, sort of political influence on the actions of the judiciary. So this is, this is what the court is trying to follow, whether the judiciary acted independently or under political influence. And it has some very, um, very strong findings on that. Perhaps something that's very significant, which has also attracted a dissenting opinion, is again what um, Karam just underlined in a minute, is this practice of um, detaining a person uh, and then releasing a person and then, you know, having, you know, detaining the same person um, based on the same set of facts, but under a different charge. So this is what uh, Demirtas underwent from 2016 until today. Now, the government uh, put forward this very specific argument, and it said that Demirtas no longer enjoys the victim status under the European Convention on Human Rights because he is no longer a detainee under the case for which he came to the European Court of Human Rights, because he was no longer technically a detainee. And, in, and, and the government says, you know, this, this, this case should be struck out of the court's register, because he's detained, but he's detained for another charge uh, for a different criminal investigation. And uh, this is also raised in the dissenting opinion of, of the Turkish judge in, in, very, in very similar terms. The court here imposed a very holistic interpretation of how to interpret Article 5 of the Convention in conjunction with Article 18. And it said, you know, arbitrary deprivation of liberty cannot be sliced into pieces. So you can't sort of slice and say, you know, there's this first detention and then the second detention and then another fourth and another fifth. 
And uh, one of the one of the very core points that it has raised is that the second detention of of the applicant was based on the same set of facts, but under a different charge. Uh, when those same set of facts were found to be violating Article Five, the second detention therefore uh, was also a violation of Article Five in conjunction with Article Eighteen. Now this is something. Uh, unprecedented, I think. I think this is the first time that the court has approached the scope of its review under Article 5 in this way, and Article 18 has aided the court to interpret uh, the Article 5 violation in this way. In, in this regard, in a sense, uh, yeah, uh, on on Article 18, I wanted just to mention something because there is a part uh, which, as you say, goes throughout the judgment. It's part of this, uh, uh, I, I think, line of abuse we see throughout. Uh, and uh, there is a moment in which the court recognizes that, uh, and I quote, the tense political climate in Turkey during recent years has created an environment capable of influencing certain decisions by the national courts especially during, during the state of emergency when hundreds of judges were dismissed and especially in relation to criminal proceedings instituted against the centers. This is kind of uh, uh, a powerful uh, message that the court uh, put there, which goes underlined. This is a point, for example, as International Commission of Jurists, we have been pushing for some time uh, to, to show what's the reality and the fact that the systemic affects the individual case on the same time. Uh, while we wait for Basha Kali, who uh, probably for issues of connection jumped out and uh, she will be back in. This happens sometimes with this Hopefully, platform. the boat did not take her out. Uh, uh, hopefully, yeah, there wasn't <laughs> a cyber attack. Um, I, I take advantage that in any case, I wanted to uh, to get Karim in. And uh, uh, I think, we. We were talking about uh, welcome back. Uh, we were talking about uh, uh, Article Five in the end because Bajak was uh, referring to Article Five. And since we have a question on Article Five, actually, uh, I will I will put this question up and I will let Karen continue Article Five based on that question. So we have a question from. Stefano Stavros, uh, which says, the Grand Chamber has found in the Miratash under Article 5.1, which is the right to liberty, uh, that the char charges against the applicant had not been based essentially on facts that could not be reasonably considered criminal conduct under domestic law. Mm -hmm. What are the implications of this finding for the fourth instance doctrine of the European Court of Human Rights, which is the doctrine that says that basically it's not a, another Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, the court has reached similar conclusions in several Article 5 cases against other member states as well. So I will, uh, Karim, let you answer first to this question. Uh, I, I think this is one of the most important parts uh, of this judgment. Uh, in the chamber judgment, uh, the court found a violation of uh, Article 5, Paragraph 3, but not Article 5, Paragraph 1. So uh, the court said that, the chamber said that uh, there was reasonable suspicion to uh, detain Mr. Demirtas. Uh, but uh, again, we challenged this and we said that, and in, in the chamber judgment, there was no assessment under Article 10. And one of the main arguments uh, that brought us to the grand chamber was that uh, without an assessment under Article 10, uh, a, an assessment that might be made under Article 5.1 will be uh, deficient. And this time, the court uh, made a detailed assessment uh, of every single evidence used by national courts to detain him. So on the one hand, it looks like uh, the European court uh, interpreting the national law, but in reality, it was looking whether those uh, evidence used uh, by the uh, by the uh, national uh, judicial authorities was enough to uh, meet the reasonable suspicion standard. So I think uh, this this part of the case cannot be 
uh, isolated from Article 10 and Article 18 uh, parts. So uh, while the court made an assessment about uh, the legality of uh, Criminal Code 314, it made the concrete assessment under Article 5. That's an in interesting part of uh, the judgment as well. So it didn't repeat the same um, evaluation uh, in Article 10. It made a general assessment about uh, the vagueness uh, of uh, membership to terrorist organization uh, crime in Article 10, but it also made concrete assessments about uh, the quality of the evidence uh, to meet whether uh, that person, uh, th th there's a reasonable suspicion that that person have committed a crime. So uh, when, you, when you complete those two parts, you see that uh, the standards that have been applied by the court is the European standard, not the domestic law, because uh, the court in Article 5 part asks whether uh, a layman can be convinced by the evidence uh, brought by, uh, by the government to detain that person. And none of them, none of them, so because individually it, it assesses uh, every single evidence uh, brought by the government, and it concluded that none of them would convince uh, an ordinary person to believe that Mr. Demitash uh, have committed a uh, crime. So uh, prima facie, it might look like a fourth instance assessment, but a, a close um, evaluation shows that this is a European um, convention uh, evaluation rather than uh, a reinterpretation of domestic law. And now I'm the one technologically unsound, in the sense I will add the microphone muted. Uh, before um, going back a bit on the Article 18, actually, I wanted to continue this reasoning uh, uh, because you referred to Article 10 as well, when you were talking about Article 5, uh, and Bashak as well. And on Article 10, uh, if I'm not mistaken, because again, I went very quickly through the judgment, uh, the, the court goes on, uh, again, on this uh, question of, uh, Kind of the abusive interpretation, if you want to say, uh, of uh, certain legislation. It says when they talk about the principle of legality of the interferences, uh, uh, we see things that uh, uh, also civil society has, has been said over and over about uh, uh, the over extensive interpretation of anti terrorism, uh, of, of terrorism offenses, for example, in Turkey. And I found it interesting the way the court uh, actually goes into that, even if probably on that it limits still to the individual case. I'm wondering, maybe we could say something more generic, maybe that's not the way the court reasons. I don't know, Bashak, uh, when you read the part on Article 10, wh what were your thoughts? Um, I, I think the, the Article 10 uh, discussion uh, of this judgment is something that would be debated and analyzed for, for some time to come. Uh, there are some very important innovations, not only in relation to um, you know, this case being about Turkey, but also in relation to the court's interpretive techniques of approaching article um, of, of, of approaching article. So, so you're 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 absolutely right uh, that the uh, and of course we should underline that the, the chamber's judgments approach to Article Ten was not necessary to examine. So, you know, from a not necessary to examine to a very uh, principled scrutiny of Article Ten. Uh, not only about the regime of lifting of parliamentary immunities, but also about the quality of law requirement in the intervention to expression by using uh, counterterrorism law is is, is 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 very significant. So the the way that I read uh, this part of Article Ten uh, again is uh, you know in, in this way. So the the court uh, you know really in this case, establishes or re-establishes, just basically reinstates that freedom of expression is, is a core convention right, but it's not just a core convention right, but it's also a core 
convention value because freedom of expression is a democratic right. So it is it is the essential, it's the instrumental right uh, of, of, of a democracy and democracy is the only system in which rights can be effectively uh, effectively protected. So it really starts from a, a very logical sort of discussion that if freedom of expression is at the core of, of protection of democracies uh, in, in any Council of Europe member state, the court moves and says that the protection of the political expression of elected members of parliament is par excellence, one of the most important forms of expression that has to invite scrutiny and that scrutiny cannot be only uh, you know to move quickly into the lane of uh, the court's work you know whether it was necessary in a democratic society the court stops for a very long time and asks the question about how democratic rights uh, can be restricted within a rule of law constitutional regime so I think this is incredibly uh, important. There are very wide-ranging lessons about how the court is here trying to really uh, discuss the relationship between uh, democratic rights, majoritarian, major, majoritarian decision-making, and, uh, and rule of law. So I think this is a very significant section. Uh, but coming back to your point about Article 314, this is again a very significant rule of law uh, discussion that the court is uh, entering into. So it almost says that I cannot analyze these restrictions about whether they were necessary in a democratic society because I have serious doubts as to the quality of law requirement, which is an absolutely necessary condition uh, for curbing democratic rights. Uh, and I think this, this part is something that we should... Uh, we should discuss uh, and debate further, but I find this part uh, incredibly significant in uh, in how the court is trying to cohere again <laughs> uh, democracy, democracy and and rule of law safeguards that they can't contradict one another, and I think uh, it, it sets that balance uh, very well. I must say. Can I add a very, very quick thing? Uh, uh, what I like the most in this judgment is that um, the court interpreted the law uh, not only based on the individual events of the case, but against the background. So not just in Article 18 part, but also in Article 10 and Article 5 discussions. For instance, when assessing Article 18 um, uh, allegations, the court refers uh, to the international uh, NGOs reports about the independence of Turkish judiciary and the structure of judges and prosecutors board. We, we have been writing this for, for like three years every day, uh, Massimo, you know. Yeah, know. When it was discussing Article 10, 314, uh, it referred to, to the assessments of the Human Rights Commissioner uh, report on how um, opposition people in Turkey uh, have been victimized by the arbitrariness of the implementation of this provision. So uh, it, 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 the, the judgment is a kind of combination of individual facts and the general background, and it uh, merges them uh, very successfully. And I think that's why uh, it, it's an in, important judgment. Thank you. We have one question, uh, also because we are slowly going towards the end. Uh, which I don't know if Karim you want to address since is that from uh, Yavuz Aydin today President Erdogan said this I, I haven't heard but uh, I assume it's true uh, this bias decision shows the hypocrisy of the European Court of Human Rights I suppose and the Turkey is not bound with it isn't this rhetoric another evidence of Article 18 violation as a whole I think someone should stop uh, the President saying this type of things because yes, uh, then they become an evidence for the next case. Uh, yes, I mean, it's obvious that one of, one of the reasons that the, the court found the violation of Article 18 was the speeches of Erdogan, but uh, he didn't stop there. He said something more. He said that um, the European court uh, decided out of its boundaries and it decided before the Turkish uh, judicial authorities uh, 
decided in the uh, main case. And I think this is a very uh, in interesting assessment. And uh, I don't know who um, was uh, his advisor stating this, uh, but I think we should remind uh, to, to the Turkish authorities that uh, the court is the last resort, resort to decide whether local remedies have been exhausted or not. And it decided that applicants uh, has already exhausted local remedies. What they want is uh, what the court decided against. They want uh, unending uh, legal game where people are being detained, released, detained, released, and detained, released. And they want all this cases uh, being reviewed separately. The court very rightly decided that this is this this is against the spirit of this convention. Um, a, a detention uh, which is based upon the same events should be read together. Uh, slicing them as uh, described by Bashak would be against uh, the spirit and the object of this convention. And what Erdogan says is that you didn't exhaust local remedies means that it should be sliced and unendingly uh, should go on. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the court's decision not to accept this uh, is a big step. So I think uh, uh, this might be another part of uh, Erdogan's reaction. Thank you. And actually, I, we just got a question which I'm going to put because it was my question to Bajak. So I'm going to put it there uh, from Sarah Clark. Thanks for this excellent discussion. Please, can you explain the next steps in terms of implementation of a Grand Chamber judgment and the consequences for Turkey in the event of non implementations? Many thanks. So, yeah, what's next? That's really the question because this judgment, this is, what's next for? for Mr. Demirtas first, uh, because there is a human being behind. Uh, and, and what's next for Turkey is the second point, because this judgment has uh, uh, enormous systemic repercussions. It's the reasoning there is there, as you said, is something we will have to talk and Turkey will have to implement for some time. And the third point, which I would add, is what's next uh, for uh, the Council of Europe, meaning that this judgment is also bringing forward a uh, concept of human rights law. Um, so I'm, I'm going to put this free question. I know I'm asking a lot and we don't have much time uh, to Bashak. So you can cherry pick the answer as you want. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for the, thanks for the flexibility. Um, so uh, so the, we, we've talked about a lot of salient uh, jurisprudential issues about the judgment, but one jurisprudential and an implementation related aspect is Article 46 uh, of the judgment. Now here, uh, exactly just going on what just Karen uh, explained, uh, the court looks at the totality of this detention, which started um, in November 2016, and it continues at this minute. And the court says, I do not see any other option uh, but uh, to request uh, the, the release of the applicant. And here I have to say that uh, this is a very rare statement uh, by this court. The court uses, as you know, this kind of orders, uh, request for release very sparingly in its, in its uh, judgments. So this is something, for those who know this court, is it something very serious and a very rare sentence. It's not something that we can see in any judgment. And the, the language is incredibly strong in that paragraph. And it says that the state must, and this is important, the state must do all, must take all measures necessary to ensure the release of the applicant. So there is, um, uh, from an implementation perspective of this individual measure, but just on the release aspect of it, there's no wiggle room. There's no, I think, the, the, it's, this is over. There's not. There's. There's nothing to discuss. There's no, no confusion as to this. So, uh, technically, the the applicant, because the judgment was final yesterday at five o'clock, even though the cyber attack might have stopped <laughs> people uh, reading the judgment, but it was final then. So, as a matter of law, under Article Forty Six, um, Demirtas must be released. Uh, must must have been released yesterday. He must be released today, and this is the legal 
uh, side of the story. So if he's not released, uh, and you know uh, what will happen, of course, this will be subject to, I think, a very serious scrutiny by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. Now, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe doesn't meet every day, and uh, and now we're uh, it has just met, met actually it had its session in December. Obviously, its next session is coming in March. And uh, it is not a body that could take decisions in between, uh, you know, these these sessions. But I think if um, the applicant is not released by the next session of the Committee of Ministers, this is going to be the number one agenda item uh, of of the Committee of Ministers. There is nothing for the Committee of Ministers to do rather than just to repeat uh, what the court has said um, in this case. Uh, so this is going to continue to be supervised. Um, under the execution uh, process of the of the Committee of Ministers from now on, which means that all the member states, uh, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, and all other organs, including the Commissioner for Human Rights, they will all have to weigh in to um, to bring uh, the the state party to the convention in line with its obligations uh, under Article Forty Six. Um, so the process, I think, will have to continue. Probably this is going to be the most um, urgent point on implementation. But Matimo, you highlighted something really important. This judgment raises a very long list of general measures uh, for the Turkish authorities. And these authorities include the parliament, the constitutional court, all high courts and all lower courts. I mean, the, the list of general measures that comes out of this judgment goes uh, about there's a serious requirement uh, of changing of judicial practice. I mean, the, the, the judicial practice of using Article 314, the judicial practice of uh, using evidence of attendance to lawful meetings as, as criminal evidence, using of political speech as, as evidence to detain, charge and prosecute individuals. All of this has to go, if you read this judgment in good faith, this is this is a roadmap for um, for for judicial reform, um, and of course that aspect, the general measures aspect, will be part of the committee of ministers' um, uh, supervision pro uh, process for 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 many years to come. And I I have no doubt that uh, jurists and um, uh, experts and human rights uh, experts and and all those who are committed to rule of law in Turkey. Uh, will will take this judgment uh, and, and seek its um, full implementation. What happens if the judgment is not implemented? As you know, you know we are in the domain of international law. Uh, you know you can talk about worst case scenarios. Um, no member state has been expelled from the Council of Europe under any of these circumstances. But no doubt there is going to be a lot of pressure. Uh, from the processes of the Council of Europe, and uh, and rightly so because uh, there's a final binding judgment. I think uh, I think we we just have to just underline that this is this is the obligation uh, as a matter of international law, and um, and it's it's incredibly clear uh, um, order from the court. Um, one, one further thing. Uh, now there are uh, 12 cases that are pending before the court, uh, lodged with uh, by uh, detained uh, deputies. And if uh, the lifting of immunity process violates the convention in, in Demirtas case, there's no doubt that uh, they, their cases also will be decided against Turkey. Plus, there are 41 uh, applications, again, brought by uh, MPs from uh, HTP, uh, whose uh, immunities were lifted. They stated that just the lifting of immunity was enough to violate the convention. And the uh, Demirtas case, uh, a Grand Chamber judgment, approves uh, this position. So another 41 uh, case uh, will be decided uh, in this way. So I think uh, apart from individual implementation for Mr. Demirtas, another question is how general measures will be implemented 
in the case of other MPs, some of them are still in prison. Some of them have been convicted, released, but convicted and uh, prohibited from uh, politics for uh, for for a period. So I think uh, this is this is the most difficult part for the Turkish authorities to implement the judgment because they will have to seize all uh, criminal cases brought against uh, politicians uh, basing on this ground. And uh, they need to enact a law, a kind of amnesty law, to, to implement uh, the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights. Otherwise, even if the Turkish uh, government implements the individual measure uh, for Mr. Demirtas, uh, for many years, uh, the judgment will uh, be pending before the Committee of Ministers to finalize the full implementation. And eventually, since there are also the systemic issues to be done. We got a question. So we, we have two questions. Uh, I will go to the last one because uh, uh, it's about what we are discussing about now. Uh, for Emre Alpun, uh, thanks the legal team uh, and particularly Bashak. Uh, he wonders, or oh, she wonders, sorry, uh, um, when, well, when the Committee of Ministers will meet in March, it's going to be the next session, will they declare the decision of the European Court to Turkey again, uh, or will they change any attitude of Turkey politically? Uh, I must admit, I wouldn't have an answer to that, because up to now the Committee of Ministers has been actually quite strong. The, the last experience I have on Kavala case, it was a quite strong committee that really asked for release immediately. Uh, so I don't know, Bashak, what's your perception of that? I mean, just very, very briefly. So the um, the Committee of Ministers is an <laughs> intergovernmental political organ of the Council of Europe. It has many tasks uh, as, as that intergovernmental organ, but one of its tasks is the monitoring of the execution of the judgments. And this task is a judicial task. Actually, it's not a political uh, task. So the task at hand is uh, actually to read a judgment and uh, you know and and make up a list of what what the judgment requires for implementation and then demand uh, for for that. Um, most of the time, uh, the Committee of Ministers has to interpret what does it mean to implement a judgment, which is a judicial interpretation, which is what happened in the case of Kavala. In this case, for the individual measure, the committee ministers, uh, they don't have to do anything. They just have to read the, the paragraph in the judgment and, and, and this is it. So th it is not a matter of changing political attitudes um, because this is a judicial task. It doesn't matter which country you are in the Council of Europe. When a judgment like this comes, you have to um, support and call for the implementation of that measure. So I'm hoping that even the Turkish representatives who sit on the Committee of Ministers would have done the same if the court ordered the release of an applicant in another country, because this is, a, as I said, it's a judicial task. It's not a, it's not a political um, task as such. So they have to do what the judgment says. And I think this judgment is, um, is very clear on, 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 on some aspects of individual measures. And it gives a huge, uh, list of general measures uh, that um, that the that the Turkish authorities will, will have to take uh, to to improve um, the rule of law uh, in its most basic in its most basic form. Thank you. And there is a last question and then I will close the questions because otherwise we're going to go way beyond time. Uh, and maybe I, I, I give this to Karam, uh, always from Yavu Seijin. Uh, the extremely vague interpretation of membership to a terrorist organization, which is the criminal offense under Article 314 of the Turkish Criminal Code, uh, and the mass arrest based on this interpretation were found in violation of Article 5 in the case of Zarakolu. Zarakolu sorry. What is the difference of the Demirtas decision in this regard? I must admit, you're more knowledgeable than me on this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, this 314 thing is, is a complex issue and it has been um, discussed by the court for a while because uh, on paper, it, it's a crime which should be connected uh, with violence. However, uh, there are three different applications of 314. 
One of them is aiding and abating a terrorist organization uh, without committing a violence, uh, just aiding a, a terrorist organization is enough to be convicted under this provision. Another one is uh, not being a member of a terrorist organization, but committing a crime on behalf of a terrorist organization. Uh, in this uh, case, uh, the prosecutor is not required to prove a link between the uh, individual and the organization, but it, it's enough just to say that this crime was committed on behalf of the organization. On both those grounds, uh, the court already found in uh, Ushikuruk and Bakr uh, judgments that they are vague, they are not foreseeable, because which acts uh, can be uh, uh, seen uh, as enough to meet the requirements of those crimes uh, are not um, properly defined by the Turkish uh, judicial interpretation. Now, in Zarakol and here, and more in Demirtas, uh, 314 per se is uh, uh, on the target. Not the um, aiding and abating, not committing a crime on behalf of the uh, uh, terrorist organization, but directly the membership to terrorist organization. During the hearing, Bashak will uh, remember, uh, one of the judges asked a Turkish representative, how do you define uh, the armed group and how do you define membership to this armed group? Uh, and um, the Turkish representative gave a very vague definition of this. And it seems that then the courts gathered information from other sources, most likely in other cases. And it states that uh, all the court of cassation requires three elements. Uh, um, this is intensity, variety, uh, and continuity uh, as elements of membership to terrorist organization. It concluded that neither in general nor in the individual case of Demirtas, those three elements uh, have been proven by, by the prosecutor and have been examined by, uh, by, by the judicial authorities. I think uh, this reflects what we have on the ground in Turkey. And for, in the, for the first time in Demirtas, the court makes this uh, visible plus uh, it uh, makes a general assessment, not isolated to Demirtas uh, case. As I stated, it refers to the report of the Human Rights Commissioner, and uh, it, it, the, the court states that this is a common uh, implementation problem in Turkey, and those three um, element standards uh, are not properly defined and uh, implemented uh, by the Turkish uh, judicial authorities. I think this is this is another uh, innovative part of uh, the Demirtas judgment. Thank you. So I think we're we're, we're getting that now really towards the end, and I think we have already uh, scattered here and there uh, uh, some picture of the judgment. Of course, since as we are lawyers, we could stay here six hours just to delve into each. Uh, each thing, but then we're going to bore people, and and <laughs> we are, and it's not going to be fair uh, to them. But I think uh, uh, I wanted to ask you actually um, a couple of last uh, questions, uh, probably unrelated. Um, so you basically just uh, uh, you worked on this case for quite some time from the international human rights law point of view angle and brought it there. Uh, how do you think, uh, how do you feel about uh, this judgment and uh, and the contribution that is there? So, you know, you are also professors, so you, you meet also young lawyers, uh, you, people who study human rights, that they go on and then they, they dream. They dream of using the law to make the world a better place, to defend victims, etc., etc. So yesterday was one of those days, uh, and and so my question would be uh, really uh, for those people that maybe are watching, uh, for those students that maybe are watching, is how 
uh, how does it feel and what do you, what do you think is this judgment uh, for you for Turkey for the for the for human rights for the promotion of human rights uh Bashak. <laughs> um i um i was i was waiting this judgment for a long time and this is a this was a long awaited judgment and you you started with with its political significance. It is a high profile case and a politically salient case. But um, as, as a law professor, I'm also very much interested in every single line and the, and the form of reasoning and how the court has reached what it reached. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the second part. So about you know being, being a law professor and what, what that means. I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very pleased with this judgment. Uh, and I see that uh, the court has uh, almost changed its way of thinking uh, about these major uh, rule of law cases. It seems like the court has really taken on the challenge of trying to make sense of a massive complexity uh, and a very complex remedial, jurisprudential, political kind of set of facts. So from, from that perspective, I have to say that um, uh, I think this judgment uh, is a massive improvement compared uh, to the to the chamber judgment, and um, and I'm I'm very pleased to have been part of it um, uh, with with Karam uh, in particular, and uh, and with the, with the lawyers and the legal team of of, of Mr. Demirtas. Um, yeah, I think my my first my first very human reaction was that this is. Uh, this is a good judgment, and um, and I think it's, it also is a judgment that gives us a lot of food for thought, and also it gives us uh, a, a lot more uh, of a motivation about how the European Court of Human Rights may tackle uh, similar types of problems, as uh, you know, authoritarian legalist practices are are significantly on the rise in in different parts of Europe. So I think the judgment is also significant for human rights challenges in Europe more broadly. Thank you. And in the meantime, we lost a bit, Karim. I think there may be certain, I hope not, a cyber attacks in Turkey. Um, but yeah, uh, I think uh, this judgment was one of the landmarks one. It's, it's, it's going to be a judgment that's going to be cited and quoted for a long time. So uh, I, I want to ask the same question to Karen, but I, I, I don't know whether we're going to be able to get him online uh, before the end of the broadcast. Uh, so I, I, I want really to thank you very much for having enjoyed this conversation. Thank Karen. Uh, I will thank you separately uh, after this. Um, it's been a great pleasure. And congratulations again uh, for this judgment. Uh, and I think there will be a lot of more, as you said, there will be a lot of more work to do. Uh, because this is one of, the, of those rulings that I think are going uh, to, to be a blueprint on whether a country like Turkey uh, stays within the rule of law track. Uh, and wants to have a rule of law response or not. And uh, it will be important really that this judgment of the European Court is properly implemented, starting with the very clear uh, order, because I think we can call it like that, um, of the European Court to release uh, Mr. Serat in Demirtas. So thank you very mu much, Bashak. Thank you to all the people that follow us. Uh, and uh, thank you to Karimati Park in remote. <laughs> uh, sometimes this platform disconnects people, so it may happen. And uh, uh, to the next one. Bye-bye.